Based on evolving intelligence, Russia may be planning a cyber attack against us. But let me be absolutely clear about something. And I would respectfully suggest it's a patriotic obligation to invest as much as you can. That was President Joe Biden only 12 months after releasing the executive order where Zero Trust was mentioned at least 11 times in one document. And in that document, he was asking head of each agency to basically develop a Zero Trust implementation plan within 60 days of the release of the executive order. Now, how realistic is it to develop a Zero Trust plan in 60 days? This episode is about the paradox and the complexity of whether implementing a practical Zero Trust is even possible in today's world. Your mission, should you choose to accept it? To help understand the paradox, it's really important to understand and why Zero Trust is talk of the town in 2022 and in spite of any other year. Now, let's be honest, just because President Biden said you should do Zero Trust and it's your patriotic responsibility to do so, doesn't really mean all the private companies would jump on it and start doing some form of a Zero Trust. That just would not be a thing, right? But there is one particular reason why this is becoming the talk of the town, and that is the accelerated digital transformation thanks to the pandemic. Most industries were already going through a digital transformation, and some people experienced a lot more accelerated digital transformation through the pandemic because of remote work, working from home, and basically everyone going online. Some industry definitely experienced a lot more accelerated digital transformation. In fact, it was so popular that the theme of one of the biggest cybersecurity conferences in 2022, RSA, had the word transform in it. That's how big the whole transformation thing was. Because of the last few years with the, with the pandemic and the hybrid work that's happening, people are working from anywhere. And one of the fundamental things that happens is in more technical and cybersecurity terms, the traditional perimeter, the way we protect, so to speak, the corporate assets, the perimeter is dissolving, it's moving. Yeah. The perimeter is where you work from. So hence the perimeter is gone, if not dissolving slowly to be gone. So it used to be that only highly technical companies would, would face these same kind of issues. But nowadays everybody's, you know, a digital company, everybody's a technical company. So what happens with this is essentially you cannot give implicit trust anymore yep. depending on your location if you're physically on your corporate network or you're just accessing assets from the open internet the second thing is because of identity uh, e e the maturity of your identity infrastructure needs to be really important so you can give access or trust without the device that you're accessing it from because with the proliferation of work from home you're like hey you bring your own device i can use a public device or I could be using a, a corporate device. Well, I think certainly with COVID, a lot of employees went to work remotely and worrying about a network perimeter became extremely difficult. On top of that, I think attackers are learning to specialize. So you have just access brokers, for example, who get access and sell it to other people who specialize in other components. So really it's getting very hard to defend if you're trying to rely on a network perimeter. Now I've done a whole video on digital transformation. I'll leave a link for this on the top and in the description as well for you to follow along. Digital transformation accelerated hasn't really changed just one or two industries. It has affected a lot of industries, including the defense contract and government agencies. The same people that the executive order is for, they also went through an accelerated digital transformation. I don't think they're they're completely unique. I think that they take them to a different level of understanding and depth, right? Because you know everyone's going to have to do something. Yeah. From the government contractor perspective, we sometimes have to do a little bit more because of the data that we're working with. Yeah. So, but I, I'm not sure it's it's really that unique from a you know a healthcare organization or a financial services information. You know, the really big part around it is helping to reduce your attack surface and you know zero trust as a concept. You know, even though it's been around for a while, it's really starting to get there because of all the ransomware and all the, the sophisticated attacks you're seeing. So this is an opportunity to use those concepts to help not only reduce your attack surface, but also re reduce attacks in general. So if you've done zero trust, you know, and, and, and followed all the pillars and the concepts, you, know, you really have a great uh, opportunity to reduce a lot of the risk to your organization, which is probably the biggest reason, right, it's coming to the forefront now, you know, risk with boards, uh, corporate boards, you know, being much more involved in cybersecurity and, and cybersecurity policy for an organization, yeah. right? And risk is always the big thing. How do I reduce my risk? Yeah. And zero trust helps organizations reduce their risk. You had your corporate network and it was, you know, we used to call it the the hard crusty shell with a soft center, <laughs> right? Kind of like a Tootsie Roll. Yeah. And now your corporate network doesn't really exist that much anymore. You know, especially there's some companies that we work with um, that are 100% cloud-based. Right. So where is their corporate network? And so those types of things have really accelerated the need for zero trust. Absolutely. And let's not forget the operational technology folks, the people who are giving us energy, gas, fuel, telecom, all these other industries that are basically not maybe classified as tech industries, but they all also went through some kind of digital transformation. If you're running an industrial control system, you have two mandates. 
First, do not cause harm or damage. It's got to be safe. Second, you want to make sure that the underlying service remains available even if everything goes south. Yeah. These escalators, if they break, what happens? They come to a stop and they lock in place. Yep. They don't go loose and have everybody tumbling down. Yeah. That's good industrial design. That's fine. Even though it's broken, you can still use it as a stairway. Yeah. That's great. In IT, the mandate is entirely different. I want to make sure information is not lost or altered or invertly disclosed. Yeah. And we call that confidentiality, available integrity, big words. I don't want to lose it. I don't want it to change. I only want people who should see it to see it. Those are orthogonal concepts. Yeah. And along with safety, of course, reliability of the system. So when you try to integrate industrial control systems are generally spoken of as OT, although nobody who's in ICS thinks of themselves as being an OT engineer. If we try to integrate them, you have this culture clash. The only way to do it is regulation. If the federal government had used its buying power on seatbelts, yep. there'd be seatbelts in the F-35, <laughs> in the uh, Abrams tank, and in the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> but the reason there are seatbelts in every car is you cannot sell one in this country unless you have a seatbelt because it's a law, it's a regulation. Yeah. And that's what's going to have to happen. Now, listening to all these experts talk about zero trust, it may seem like zero trust is a lot of work, and it is. It may even seem like you're trying to read and understand what the matrix code was. Funny enough, it doesn't have to be that difficult. Zero trust is actually quite simple. So it really is just a set of concepts and principles on how you do operations and secure an organization. I mean, that sounds simple enough, right? Most leaders over there will understand what zero trust is and why do they need it. But for the technical audience hearing this going, this is not that simple. Let me just tell you the technical definition of it. There are basically five pillars that define zero trust. Identity, data, application workload, user, and network identity. Now, some of these are more easier to implement over the other. You may have already have some components that have already been implemented for some of these pillars in your organization. The probably the easiest one that you see is identity, right? Everybody's already done identity, even though they may not think they've done identity, right? So if you if you just have, you know, I'm gonna an example, you got you're a Windows shop and you've got AD running. Yep. That's an identity principle. You can leverage that to do the identity portion of zero trust. So that's, you know, again, net, zero trust network access is probably the second easiest pillar because people already have something or have an idea. If you're doing VPNs, you have concepts that will translate to doing zero trust network access. Yep. You may have to swap out or change, you know, some of your networking and all that. But again, it's something that you've probably already bought. Maybe the capabilities haven't turned it on or, you know, you've done some amount of micro segmentation in your network. You know, zero trust network access takes micro segmentation to like the nth degree, right? Because that's that's the basic principle behind network access. So if there are already parts of this implemented in our organization and sounds like President Joe Biden basically said something that we're already doing, where is the paradox? That brings me to the first paradox, the technical and non-technical challenges of implementing zero trust today. Now, zero trust is not a new concept. The concept has been there for a while, but it only became a hot topic over the past few years. And it is true. A lot of the challenges that you would face are technical. Now, whether the technical part is products that you may already have in your organization support some part of the solution, they may not cater for all the five pillars that are required to implement a zero trust or the challenge could be non-technical basically cultural change where a lot of people had to push their employees to start using VPN, start using MFA or two-factor authentication when they were going through the whole pandemic mode so they can still secure while they were at home and suddenly everyone was basically asked to work from home. Now imagine adding zero trust onto the culture. It would just be seen as another friction. It's not a piece of technology that you buy and turn it on and then suddenly have zero trust. It's, you know, not literally, but it's a it's a state of mind. It's a state of being. Yep. It's, it's a set of principles that you mature into. And the purpose, the end game is, like I said previously, to not give implicit trust to access or authorize access to any assets. The two biggest ones besides the technical ones are organizational ones, meaning you have groups in different departments who don't know how to talk with each other. And then there are architectural ones, meaning the philosophy, the way in which you approach solving the problem is different. This is definitely a journey, um, probably a multi-year journey to be honest, because organizations have been used to doing IT in a certain way. And we've been doing it for 
30 years, 40 years for some companies. Yeah. And you've got all these legacy things that you really in some ways have to tear down or transform or whatever, you know, buzzword you want to use to do something that, that's actually relatively new. You know, even though it, Google was talking about it, you know, 10 years ago or so, um, it's still a relatively new concept. And, and a lot of the technologies have only now started to come out. If you're a government contractor like we are, you know, we have to protect certain types of information differently than just normal corporate data, right? Yeah, yeah. But what kind of, of those restrictions do you have? And you have to document all that out and plan it and say, okay, I have a policy that restricts, you know, Bob in engineering who works on these classified programs and needs to access these things. Yeah. And then you're gonna have a different policy for Jane, who's, you know, in, uh, in this other engineering group who, do, who works on only commercial contracts. And yeah. then you got a different one for your HR folks who never need to see any of that engineering work. Yeah. And all of that takes a lot of planning. And that's probably the biggest mistake people make is not doing enough of the upfront planning work. Now talking about upfront work brings me to the next paradox, which is, is it even practical to implement zero trust today? The easiest example that I can use to explain this is imagine Netflix. They started off as a DVD VHS store back in the day. And today, you know Netflix as the online streaming service, which is giving you thousands of videos and movies that you can watch basically anytime, anywhere around the world with an interconnection. Imagine the kind of data they have stored for all these years. And for the sake of example, if it took them 70 or 60 years to figure out how to get from a DVD stage to the online streaming stage, technology has changed that dramatically over the past 60, 70 years. The data that they collected for someone like me who may have ordered a VHS tape back in 60, 70 years ago when it used to be Netflix rent a DVD or rent a cassette store the data that they had on me back then is not valid today because a I don't have a VHS player B I don't even know who wants a DVD player these days as well I hope you're not one of them but the concept of that data was relevant from that particular time. It made sense over there. But as Netflix and other companies have moved on to become much more modern, much more digitally transformed, like today's example of digital Netflix is basically having all these multitudes of movies, knowing my preferences, I can add reviews, I can share reviews, I can do all of these amazing things with the movies that are watching instead of waiting to go and check out, instead of waiting for a whole week before I can return a VHS tape, that whole concept doesn't even exist anymore. So the data that is available today, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know, man. I know in which business it would make sense for you to go back onto that 70 years of data to figure out all that data that has been collected, classify it in a possible standard that doesn't even exist anymore. Once you've figured that out, but, and hopefully if you're not bankrupt by the time you even get through this, you still have a business that you're running as Netflix online. So that's the complexity of implementing a practical zero trust. So that's, me, that's my second paradox, which also brings me to this question. I'm sure there are more challenges than just simply talking about data for 70 plus years, right? The two that are probably the hardest is data and uh, application workload. The data tagging, I think, technology space is lagged behind. Then the application workload, you know, to me, that one is more of relying on some of the other pillars to help it. Yeah. And I think that one's probably like the furthest behind from what I can tell. The result of the mandate will be, we will see forward progress. And as I mentioned, it's gonna be multi-speed, multi-lane. Mm -hmm. Some folks are gonna shore up their multi-factor authentication. Some folks are gonna do better job of segmentation, user analytics, um, zero trust network access. All of those things are good things. So those should proceed ahead. <laughs> in the long run where the biggest challenge is going to be is when we see clouds interacting with clouds. All this conversation about the two paradoxes that I mentioned so far may make you think this is going to be really hard. I don't even know what who would do this. Fortunately, there are some public examples of people who have gone through the zero trust process. So we all know it is possible. Like there's Akamai, there's a lot of other companies. We've implemented zero trust in our own environment for about 7,000 users. We utilize our own products internally at Akamai. And, and those products are you know, fundamental to what we do. That's not your traditional OT company that you were talking about. They don't give me gas, they don't give me electricity. I mean, they're not even an example of an enterprise that you has been there for 70, 80, or maybe hundreds of years. So how do you even compare that? There are examples of successful zero trust outside of this as well that experts can share these days. On a very far, so the left end of it is, VPNs have been the traditional way of accessing corporate assets. Yeah. But now, you know, because you're working from anywhere and VPNs can degrade your performance of your network, you have to sort of eliminate 
uh, a VPN and a zero trust framework or principle could be could be one way to get to it. I think looking at NIST special publication 80207 is a good start. Um, but to summarize, really you're looking at having some sort of centralized strong authentication with context, usually including MFA, having some way to validate device trust. So thinking about the uh, security state of a device, if it's enrolled in MDM, if it has your endpoint protection, and then lastly, making sure to re sort of reauthorize using these components on a regular basis. Now the thought of a successful model does exist is obviously promising, but the biggest promise for zero trust is to be frictionless. When, for example, one of your sales professionals who is logging into your corporate network from Indonesia, they will not see any friction in able to access a particular uh, resource that they want to access, except depending on heuristics, where they're accessing it from, which network they're on, which you know geo uh, geography they're coming in from, the system will automatically step up your authentication or step down. Yeah. So there's the heuristical mechanism that we built, but from a user perspective, you know, it, there's no change. And that's the ultimate place where we need to be with the zero. Yes. Now, if you have been patient with me so far in this entire episode, you probably would have noticed that I have used the word trust so many times. To be precise, I have used it 56 times. Well, 57, including the one that I just used right now. Trust is also my third paradox. Can machines truly trust humans? Trust as humans is quite hard as well. Now, just because I'm here, I have a great beard, great smile that I can welcome you with, doesn't really mean you will start trusting me with information of zero trust. Similarly, the machines that have to work on a day-to-day -day basis with humans, how are they supposed to build trust when we ourselves cannot figure it out? Fortunately for us humans, we have a brain. We can use our brain to make a call for, yes, Ashish on the other side looks really great. You may even trust the content that is being produced over here by listening to this, watching this. You can even amplify the trust that you have by showing signals of your support. Like for example, if you're watching this on LinkedIn or YouTube, you can probably choose to like the video, comment on it, or maybe subscribe or follow the YouTube LinkedIn page. Or if you're listening to this on your Apple or Spotify, you may give us a rating and review on Apple or give us a heart as a favorite podcast on Spotify. Signals like these are what builds trust. It also signifies to the other person, hey, I am creating content that can be trusted and that is providing value. If you're already sending me the trust signals, you're already letting me know that, hey, you trust the video that I'm creating is helping you in some way and really means a lot to me. However, with machines, it's probably a bit different because they don't have a brain and they can't send us any signals to tell me or you that, hey, I trust this human is a sheesh. Maybe they have a second brain that we can give them? No. Can you imagine if every machine had a brain and how many brains you would have just to organize and manage the machines that you have in your network, how, depending on how complex the corporate network is. Fortunately, as humans, we have created social media network for ourselves so we can send signals and start trusting entities and identities on the internet by watching the YouTube video, subscribing to the podcast, doing all these things that signal that, hey, I trust this. Unfortunately, we don't have a social network for machines right now. Does that mean for us to ultimately have zero trust, the third paradox can only be solved if we have a a social network for corporates. Yes, not, I'm not talking about LinkedIn over here. I'm talking about corporates as in Netflix is comfortable to talk to YouTube and share videos along with each other because they have a zero trust system and they can also choose to decide to share it with, I don't know, Apple as well. That would be a really complex world, but hence the paradox in this video. Can machines truly trust humans? No. I hope this video was helpful in understanding the paradox that exists in the zero trust model today as you stand in implementing this. Many leaders are going through the challenge of implementing it, questioning, developing a plan. Hopefully this puts some interesting food for thought for a lot of people to talk about how we can solve these problems of paradox as it exists today. Now, if you feel I have missed something about zero trust or if you have an opinion on, is it really practical to implement zero trust today? Leave a comment below and I'll try and respond to it. But until then, if you enjoy content like this on cloud security and a lot of the original content that we create in this space, make sure you follow and subscribe and give me the trust signal. <laughs> I will see you in the next video. See ya. Peace.